Hey guys, this week, What Women Binge, we have my favorite TV husband. We have Sean Astin here. Hi. That's a good distinction. Right? You're my favorite TV. Don't tell everybody else. <laughs> are you in your backyard? Because wherever you are is so beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's our backyard. Neat, neat. Wow. Neat, neat. That's what happens when There's you There's no like, dogs out here. I'm sure the dogs will come out in a minute. Yeah, this is what happens when you have 50 blockbuster movies. Um, hold on, Sean. You're like we here. Uh, we're like outside of it. Like, go ahead. I tried to get you on here for two years, and here you are. You're a very busy I'm, man. It's so true. Sean has three girls to my three boys. And um, they don't and line up in ages now. A little bit, just like a little, a little bit, bit, right? They're like How old, old. Are yours? 27, 21, and 18. Okay. So 18 is my oldest, and then 16 right. and 11. Yeah. And then Amanda's got three as well, but she's got a boy and two girls. Yep. Oh, that's and a good, good, that's a nice mix. It I don't is. know anything You're... about boys. Boys are weird, <laughs> except that now they that. bring them into the house. Oh. Now the 18 year old has a boyfriend, Kenny. We like Kenny very, very much. We love Kenny. Oh. Well, Kenny's that's family now, but uh, but yeah, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, your daughters start bringing guys home. Oh God, <laughs> awful! <laughs> so, I mean, it's wonderful. It's weird. my wife said, "Don't you I'm want so them to be happy?" Yeah. My wife said, "Don't you want them to be happy?" And my response was, "Yeah." <laughs> it's like partially happy, happy. Is fine. And yeah, Sean they, saying that makes it, but you're always going to be the nicest to everyone. I bet those girls don't want to leave. You guys get chatty and like, you know. We embrace people. We're embracers. Yeah, you are. Aww. Yeah, you are. Like literally, like physically as well. Like literally. <laughs> are you literally. a hugger? Oh, yeah. I He's learned from my hugger. mom. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Well, Do, you know sometimes mom there's... Do you know who his mom is? No. His mom's Patty Duke. Yeah. The incredible. Not actress that. Patty Duke. Yeah, also from the oh, 90s. Cool. Wait, the 1890s? That's me. The 80s? <laughs> <laughs> My mom well, passed in uh in uh 2016. But uh my daughter was saying me to me today, you know, our, one of our dogs, we have a bunch of dogs. One of the dogs, whenever I come in, always grabs a bone or a toy and runs in circles. Yeah. And I and I, I don't know how to interpret this behavior, <laughs> except uh, that you know it's an it's clearly an expression of happiness, right? Yeah. But she she said, well, you remember when Bella, my 18-year-old now, when she was a little kid, sometimes she would squeeze you and she would just squeeze so much and she just couldn't. She's like, I just love you so much. I can't like she couldn't squeeze hard enough. Oh, yeah. That's the yeah. hug impulse. Yes, That's, it it truly it. is. Yeah. I am yes, a person. I, I, I just want to love you. And sometimes that comes out in a lot of affection. Yeah. Yeah. He gives good hugs. That's for sure. But then also, wait, can we, let's go into your, let's go into your famous family for a minute. Cause your dad. John was, Aston. Go yep. Miss. He's go Miss. Go original Miss. Go Miss. Um, yeah. How, how are you feeling about the new Wednesday show? I enjoyed it. I thought well, it started with the dance. I am basically a 13 year old girl because <laughs> like I was a Swifty before anyone my age was a Swifty. Now all the guys my age are all Swifties. They're like, wait, she made a billion dollars. I'm a Swifty. I'm like, I was a Swifty when I was running on my iPods and I had Lady Gaga and Taylor Swift and Katy Perry and all these people on my running playlist. And my daughters are like, there's something so wrong with you, man. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but when she when Wednesday was doing that dance, I was just like, I watched it a thousand times. I loved it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I love the show. My dad, I tried to get him to watch it. He's 93 now uh yeah he's 93 and we love we have such good talks we talked the other day we can't call each other casually because we don't know how to get off the phone <laughs> so like he called me for my birthday and i was like it took me two days to call him back and then we talked for like eight hours <laughs> it was just we we love each other but he he actually i learned something really powerful about him and that dynamic you're asking about the kind of like successive shows that the original people don't get to be in for whatever reason when the Raul Julia movie uh, version of of uh, Adam's Family came out, I thought Raul Julia was just awesome. Yeah. I thought he was so good. He wasn't the same as my dad. My dad is this classic. I mean, his comedy, what he could do with his eyes and his swashbuckling and his <laughs> like, you know, tish soup du jour, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But it was different. And I just remember seeing him be really bummed out that they kind of shunned the show the tv wow. show and so when lord of the rings came out 
and pretty pretty soon thereafter like the big question was do you think that it'll get remade and i was like it will absolutely get remade and it'll probably be great and i had like pre-processed what it meant to establish something that was really well loved and then kind of like the nature of time and creativity and business and whatever kind of that tide moves so um yet another of the million things that my dad gave to me was modeling that that thing but he's mm. he's fantastic i think didn't they just aren't they redoing night court, yes, night yes. court? Yeah, yeah well he was in the original night court so i think he oh. needs to be yeah he played harry anderson's father oh and he needs to come back he yeah. does right he does he had such a memorable line that people quote to me at conventions all the time uh i'm much better now it was like <laughs> perfect contribution to the mental health conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually your true. That's true. So, and then your brother, Mackenzie, Mackenzie was yeah. on um, Facts of Life. He was on Facts of Life in the eighties. Yeah, in the eighties, eighties. Right, we were talking about the nineties. It was in the eighties. Yeah, with George. Clooney. He was there before George Clooney got there. Remember George Clooney was well, on. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, yeah. Yeah. No, Mac did six years on Facts of Life, and now. He is, you know, we, we talk about all of us as journeyman actors. Mac is a legit journeyman actor. He is on everything. We were just, uh, I mean, no matter what we put on, Ali had an audition for CSI she, or uh, NCIS. She puts on NCIS and there's Mac. Hmm. You know, she. Oh, we put on uh, The Magicians. There's Mac. You put on Psych. There's Mac. You put on like any yeah. show that you find, Mac is on it just being really good his big thing besides facts of life was um he played so i did rudy no. and rudy came oh, out you and did? I, Wait, I that did was rudy. you yeah. <laughs> and no one is meant to chant it but it happens but um <laughs> but the year after disney put out a film called iron will that was everybody mistakes it for white fang because it was about dog sled racing. Kevin Spacey was in it. David Arkin Stiers was in it. And uh, Mac played the title character, Will. So he and I both had like feature films in the theaters a year apart from each other. We, we played the title character. And he yeah. is he's really, really wonderful. And it was directed by, um, uh, it was directed by, oh my God, Hill Street Blues, Charlie Hayden. Oh wow! Right? Yeah, I was driven by Charlie. God, I can't believe it took me a minute there. But um, well, that's why we have the brain usually. <laughs> yeah, yeah hey, brain, hurry! Up. Yeah, but I didn't give him any hook on that one. No, his fingers were waiting, and he couldn't figure out the Google. <laughs> his fighting <laughs> senses were tingling. Wait, that's okay. So when we were doing, we did a show. For those that don't know, we did a show called No Good Nick. By the way, I still get like I was at a con this weekend, and I get so many little like eleven to. 17 year old saying i love no good nick when's the next season coming yeah but we got to play husband and wife with a very fabulous cast of teenagers in uh no good nick on netflix for 20 episodes but it was so funny to me my, my favorite thing well first of all you said you had never done a sitcom really before but your whole family comes from sitcoms so you were like i feel like i've been missing out on this genre and like it, you were so excited about it, it was so cute it's and what i wanted to do it's what it was literally you know i realized during rudy where the whole idea of rudy is he believed in himself and he wanted his dream and his dream was to play football and there's something so strange that i was 21 years old and i it was the first conscious time i can remember thinking oh you can have like dreams like you can identify something specifically as something you want and go towards it and i think you know intuitively we all have dreams and things we want to do but the idea of labeling it mm -hmm. and you know okay. and in inviting others into your narrative as you try to achieve it um and well, being on a sitcom was one for me for sure for sure it was on your vision board as the kids it was. <laughs> it was i also did i also realized that not all dreams come true which is a bummer <laughs> sorry don't yeah. focus on that part mm -hmm. but um but that one came true i mean i remember in in particular we were filming on um uh 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 at uh, uh um oh what so, uh, it? yeah it was it was i oh called it the netflix lot <laughs> No, it now it's an epic club, but it was, it's Sunset, Sunset Gower. Jesus. Oh, Sunset Gower. That's right. That's right. Jiminy Christmas. What's yeah. going on with the brain? It's been um, a few years and there's been COVID in between. So, you know. 
my kid was telling me today that COVID brain happens. The more you have it, I've had it three times. Three? Cognitive decline. I think she's just trying to F with me. No, it's actually true. Oh, no. It's terrible. I've not Um, had COVID yet, but... I've definitely oh, seen good. I hope you know. I've had it two times. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know, Sean. I didn't know you had it three. Holy three moly! Times, and yeah. you guys were super safe about it too. I know, but the girl, my daughter, never has it. Uh, oh, wow. My wife. Hold on, I'm just getting a cicada off of my computer. Uh-oh. <laughs> he's coming out. out he's gonna die there. Um, sorry, he's flying <laughs> to my computer. That's, That's the way it goes. That's what you um, get. No, but um, um, I remember very clearly going to the bus stop at Sunset Boulevard and Beverly Glen, which is right on the kind of border of Westwood Village where UCLA is. And people know the movie theaters that they've seen the, you know, all the, not all of them, but the, you know, a lot of the premieres are there and Bel Air, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. It's like right on the cusp. There's a fire department there. And I caught a bus and I drove the bus all the way into deep into Hollywood to where Sunset Gower Studios was. And I, I went through the little, You know, I just remember like every step of that day because I was going, I think I was 14 and it was, and I didn't have, I wasn't, I was, wasn't accompanied. I just was like (laughs) doing my own thing. It was like, Mac had to be driven, you know, you drive to work in the morning and there I was taking a bus. It was like a big kid. And I, uh, this bug is so big on my screen. (laughs) (laughs) Go get it. Go get it. You got it. Yeah, he's, he's dead. We're about to have. I thought it. he was dead before, but uh, and I just remember going and being in the back of the stage, like the audience is here, yeah. looking at the the proscenium, and the cameras are all there, and I was like behind all of it, and it was just this. I just wanted to be in it. I want, and we teased each other. I would tease him about being on a stupid TV show, and he'd say, "Oh, well, you can't get another movie like this." How mm-hmm. Hollywood kids tease, tease each other. Hello. And, uh, and I, and I just remember like, it just looked so cool. And so then we were literally on the stage next door, our show, Melissa, my show was on the stage next door Aww. to where Max thing was. And I just remember being outside, like it took 40 years, but it happened. Full <laughs> circle yeah. moment. Dreams yeah. do come true. Yeah. It we do. only got 20 episodes, but it was a good show. I think, uh, I think Ooh. it shouldn't have been in front of, uh, it was like a, for those that didn't see it, it was like a, a show that was like, it was funny, but it also had a lot of heart and a lot of like hard stories. So this you young girl- You want to say girl, the premise? Yeah. You want to say it? No, you do it. So the so we have a family of four of us. There's We have two teenagers, a boy and a girl, and a little girl knocks on our door and says, where were you? You didn't pick me up at the train station. Like I'm, you know, my, my mom died and you're the closest family I have. You have to take me in. And- uh, we take her in. Turns out she's conning us like the whole time. She's literally like scamming us. And you don't know why, but for 20 episodes, she scams us until we figure out why. And then, and we kind of, I'm not very nice. That's whenever, whenever there's a kid that's like, I saw you in No Good Nick. I'm like, are you afraid of me? Because my kid, <laughs> no, but you, you weren't bad. You were just, you were the, cold. it was logical. Cold. Yeah. yeah. No, you're just like sensible. Like if someone showed up on your doorstep, would you just take them in? Wouldn't there be some follow up? But you're but, like, of course, honey, come on in. Let's help her find her. She's yeah, family. Yeah. And I'm like, the thing that oh. I love about, I know, I know you wanted to have it like a single cam comedy so we could get into like the way, the more dramatic moments that you can build and stuff. But what I loved about the sitcom live audience thing was like, if you watch the first few episodes, it's kind of like, Oh yeah. Did I see that show in the seven? It was like, mm-hmm. it, it didn't seem to have graduated with the 30 years of technology and understanding about, yeah. you know, how families on sitcom television work. So you, it, you, you could miss it. You could just be like, Oh, that's a stupid show. But then the more it unfolds, the more you're like, there's something really subversive happening right yeah. here. And it what that does to the idea of the American family is I, I it's the point of sitcoms. Really, I mean, Adam's family, the truth about Adam's family was they were the normal people. Yeah. All right. the normal neighbors were the crackpots who didn't treat people right. Yeah. yeah. And so for us, it was like, yeah, I don't know. I I it's and then they told us they made the grave mistake of sitting us all down. And sharing on the last day what the whole second season was. They broke yeah. down broken down the whole second season. And it was awesome. And we were ready for it. 
it They're was all, and the show had finally gotten like we had figured out how to do everyone knew how to do their thing melissa you already knew how to do it but we the rest of us were trying no, to no no it, it was fun and it was figuring it all out i what i didn't like was having an audience there because my first two shows clarissa and sabrina while they were looked at as sitcoms did not have an audience and that really helped us not play for laughs uh, my show melissa and joey was just like balls out funny so i felt like you know, it worked there and I got used to, it took me a while, but I got used to the live audience, but I always felt like I was hamming it up more. I'm already a ham. I didn't need any help, but with no good Nick, like it wasn't like set up, set up joke. So people would laugh at inappropriate times. I'd be like, Nope. Like she knocks on her door. She's crying. The first take she did. We didn't know yeah. she was going to do this because she hadn't done it in rehearsal. She walks in and she is bawling tears. You didn't pick me up at the station. And like, and the audience is like, didn't know what to do. And this one guy goes, ha. And we we're like, no, wait, hold on. Not yet. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. The joke's going to come in a few minutes. Hold on. You know, and so it wasn't like, I think the audience didn't know what to do with it. They were yeah. like, do we laugh now? Do we not? Yeah. Do we miss the joke? Do we, you yeah. know, so I think, I if think the creators like liked that. I think the they liked that awkwardness. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't sort of, I mean, it was genuinely awkward because the format, that's what I talk about. But the, um. so right now I'm on the Connors. Oh, you are? Yeah, I'm, this I just did my uh, this week was my I think my fifth episode. On well, the if they need a director, I'm available. I'll come direct. Uh, Ro we Robbie, like some of our directors are on it. Like I know Julie's there. Like a bunch of our people. Is Robbie Countryman there? Yeah. Oh no, it was his birthday yesterday. He's one of my favorites. He did a lot of Melissa. Well, he was our our first AD on Melissa and Joey, so he's a good friend. Oh, I yeah. love him. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Wait, what but what I was what I was thinking was. Yeah, it you know you talk about playing for laughs, yeah. And the that show's been going for sixteen years. Like they, those writers are yeah. surgeons. You know, they, it's it is it's impossible not to play for laughs. Except that every now and then the show gets raw, like yeah. serious yeah. Heart, drug abuse, like you know men, mental stuff, like you know. And you and I think the it builds credibility with the audience when they're like and the audience. The amazing thing is like they want to go there. Yeah. The audience wants to go there and the funny. And so yeah. I, I, um, yeah, I like dig I, a little I mean, deeper stuff, right? Like, oh yeah, they, 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 they it, it makes them, I mean, we know this, we know that you care about people if you can see them being vulnerable, mm -hmm. but I think in TV, a lot of times executives and stuff are nervous that, you know, cause they're thinking about selling, selling stuff, you know? And That's so they, yeah. you know, do you want, yeah. but, um, yeah. So, but I, do you remember when we were doing that show? I got to also do like a couple episodes of Big Bang Theory. Oh and, yeah, and that, which you like, were thrilled about. Oh my god, it was just like that moment in my life. I mean, you know what you say? I can die now. I literally yes. I'm on borrowed time now because that was the <laughs> I could die. That was it. That was the pinnacle. Time. Yeah. I did it. Yeah. That was the arc of your season. Was that the? <laughs> yeah. Oh. But right. Yeah. Um, so wait, so Shawnee, okay, here's the funny thing. Like you would be, okay, we have to talk about your voiceover career, but we also have so many movies to cover, but we also want to talk about all the things you've been. So let's start with voiceover. You have this incredible voiceover career. How the hell did that happen? Lord like, of the Rings. Ninja Turtle. Lord of the Rings happened and we had dialect coaches. Like before, oh. I was 29 when I went to do Lord of the Rings. I had probably done 50 voiceover auditions and gotten one and then i went to do lord of the rings worked with these dialect coaches for like six weeks i mean every day for hour 90 minutes we would talk about breathing and like how your tongue and your teeth and what your cheeks are doing and your nose and your head voice and your chest we would and there were you know things up in their office this like you know container ship container we were working in and they would play we would you know, we, we just, we did the kind of work that you would think would go, you, that you do if you were in a class. Yeah. It was like oh. world-class. It wasn't just free. They're paying me. They weren't, you know, <laughs> like they're paying me to learn how to do this. And when we got back before even Lord of the Rings came out, I started booking job after job after job. And it was very clear because like when I would audition for them the first time, you, you know, you're in the, you know, this you're in the booth, right? And the engineers and the directors and the other people, they're on the other side of the glass. Uh-huh. 
and you know the engineer's typing the director's right next to the engineer with the mic thing all right if you could do that one faster great um if you could do that slower and when they don't when they're off the mic they're talking about you and you can't hear them and they turn around and sitting on the couch is the pullet bureau and the firing squad and you know they're talking about things you don't know what the hell they're talking about (laughs) and they turn around they're like great thanks very much and you're like they just talked all that time and they came up with i don't need to do any more like i didn't get that gig What I realized was that I couldn't, before Lord of the Rings, I couldn't hear what they were hearing. Okay. You know, if you've ever worked with somebody, it's, you know, and you're like, okay, well, a little louder. And they Mm -hmm. do it the exact same. You're like, okay, but a little, do it. You know what? Take it up 50%, twice as loud, barely an adjustment. And you're like, is there something broken in my instruction? Mm -hmm. Like, why are they not... And it's like that. They would be like, well, if you could pitch it up, well, if you could, you know, put a smile in it. Well, if you could do all these little notes that they would give you. And I think I, I'm like, I'm doing that. Yeah. yeah. Why is it like, just because you're feeling it doesn't doesn't mean mean it's happening. It's coming across. So, uh, and now after the Lord of the Rings training camp that I went through, I could now hear what they were hearing. And, um, and also you, you start to, I mean, that one, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was, was, I was the last of the Turtles cast in the Nickelodeon 2012 iteration. And we did five, we did five years. And you're Raphael, right? I'm Raphael. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Come on, stop talking and start fighting. Ah, sewer (laughs) apples. Um, but we, I was, I was to playing the lead special agent Oso Yes, you know, that's what I know you from. Actually, you're also it's all part of the plan. I can't even do it anymore. So, but I remember oh. leaving. I would see the pros because they have like okay for your anybody who really wants to understand like the voiceover business. You've got your uh, celebrity voices, and then you've got your kind of working class voices, and near the twain shall meet. And the celebrity voices get paid half a million dollars, whatever, two million, whatever they get. They get an extraordinary amount of money. The working uh, class voice will get like eleven hundred bucks. Yeah, you know what? Eleven hundred bucks. Eleven hundred bucks. Right. So, uh, and that's knowable because I just actually negotiated. I was just negotiated. negotiated. Yeah, the animation, the animation deal. Did you know that? Yeah. Yes. Which was incredible, and we got some really good stuff. But the um, but. Well, because you're, you're very involved with the union, and uh, your mother was the president of the union for a yeah, long time, right? Yeah, yeah. And and was. you're very involved with that, and very like ear to the ground, knowing yeah. what's going on all the time. Well, they put me on the animation committee, and I was so I was like just really appreciated that. And we went through it was a short negotiating period, but I really felt like I belonged mm. in the room with these other world class. Well, I don't think we're allowed to out each other we can, we can only say mm. that's the etiquette is you can say if you're on a negotiating committee but you don't say if someone else is. Else. but yeah. several of these other you know big names staples in the well not necessarily well they are big names in the animation world but not necessarily names that you would recognize like walking down the street and that's the point i was starting to get at is there's a little bit of a class distinction and and uh s- some some interesting biases Mm -hmm. that develop and they're earned and sometimes they're true and sometimes they're not where the celebrity people will voices will come in and have no awareness of like how the system actually works. And you can see the directors and the people like it's worth fighting through getting this world-class star who certainly has all the talent in the world to do it, but to understand like the mechanics of the, it's different now. I think now everybody. Well, but like, like my friend, like we've had Tara strong on here. Who's one of my closest friends and Tara um, is interesting because she was Smurfette for so long, but then when the movie comes out, it's Katy Perry. So Right. Well, like kind of right. not fair. So right. this one well, that's it. Millions, you just said it. Million, yep, millions you of dollars. Just said it. To this character when she's been doing it for decades. Yeah. And never... would Katie would Katie drive to Burbank every Tuesday? Every, every Tuesday for six hours. Thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, yeah. So, but the but the I think I started in some people's minds as a celebrity voice. Oh yeah. But it like, it didn't fit. It didn't suit me. Yeah. And, and the agents would send an offer 
And I'd be like, I want that $1,100. I want to drive to Burbank. I want to sit in that studio with those other actors. I want, I, they're, I want to be with them. Yeah. yeah. I want to be with them and do that work with them. I want to look at the director in the eye and know that where they were a month ago and where they're going a month from now. And I don't know, I just loved that journeyman experience. And, uh, and, and so it's just, it just built, it built from there. I haven't done a lot in a while. I'm doing one DreamWorks thing right now, but, um, but if you look at your IMDb, it's like oh, tons yeah. of shows Stinson animated. I mean, not just the movies and TV shows that you've graced, but the all the, the animated is pretty impressive. Hey, Amanda, you know how we always give our guests really great socks? Yes. Well, I just found some new socks, and I think you did too, Dr. Motion. I, I love Dr. Motion socks. Dr. Motion socks are awesome. Here's the crazy thing about Dr. Motion. It's a wellness brand. It's a wellness brand, but for your feet. And well, and it benefits all parts of your body, really. They have mild compression socks, which are ankle length to knee high. They're smooth. They're reinforced toe for optimal comfort and durability, which is great. Uh, I wore them on a hike this week. And let me tell you, girls' feet held up. Yes, and good. the compression tights are awesome for being on the airplane. They help me with circulation and... You know, they just, they just hurt, but they're cute too. When you think of compression socks, you don't always think cute, but I got compliments on mine and yours have tiny mushrooms. Mine have tiny mushrooms because we're in a mushroom phase right now. And <laughs> there's mushrooms are hot and I like my mushroom socks and the graduated compression tights have full leg support to reduce leg fatigue. Yes. And for our diabetic customers, they have the most comfortable diabetic socks. They are non-compression and they've been designed specifically to keep the needs of diabetics in mind. So there's no binding lycra and the graduated cuff allows maximum stretch. And look, no matter your age or gender, whether you're a nurse, a mother, a teacher, a traveler, an athlete, someone who stands all day, someone who sits all day, they're great for everybody. And the spring summer collection just launched on the website. So go check it out. Have fashionable, comfortable, healthy feet. All you got to do is go to drmotionsocks.com and check out the products and explore the whole new collection. And it's Dr. D-R Motion Socks. D-R-M-O-T-I-O-N-S-O-C-K-S.com. Check it out. Explore the new collection. And so wait, let's go, let's go back to you signed a poster for me, an original 19, what was it, 1980, 85 Goonies? Yeah. The Goonies. Let's talk about the Goonies. I mean, everybody, uh, just just for a second, because I know you've told the stories a million times, but like, just tell us your favorite story from the Goonies. What's like your favorite? 30, 30 just raced across the mind. Somewhere <laughs> inappropriate. Um, <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> um, well, how old were you? So you would have been like... You can actually find online. I posted uh, during COVID my audition. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And when I watch that audition, I am shocked that I got offered the part. Really? Shocked. Yeah. Cause I like, I didn't get through it. I kept messing it up. And finally they, they, um, so, okay. So my mom and dad got divorced and my dad was living in a condo. We'd moved close enough away where we could ride our bike to him. So I'm a Nepo baby. I mean, that's just, there's no other way to say. Yeah, it. I can't even. Um, that, we've already had that conversation on here. Where like, it doesn't even. Everyone like, I don't know a single. Um, you know, my sister's an oyster farmer because my dad's an oyster farmer. I don't know any other oyster farmers. That I would like. be a great oyster farmer. I could play an oyster <laughs> farmer in the <laughs> movie, yeah, not in the TV show. Farmer. I don't want to do the voiceover TV show. No, I'm kidding. You can play my um, dad in the oyster farmer movie. <laughs> um, well, so I go over there, and so it was their agents really are why I got into acting. Because they were like, oh, you know, there's lots of parts that, that are being hired for kids. My mom came to me when I was seven or eight and was like, listen, do you want to be in this after school special with me? I said, um, do I get money? <laughs> she said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it goes into an account. You can't have it until you're like 25 or something or 18, whatever. Uh, and I said, can I get out? Of, do I get out of school? And she said, well, you have to sit, teacher. But basically, yeah, I'm like, yeah, what's the what's the downside of acting in a movie? I couldn't think of any. Um, so th in 84, I think it was, I rode to my dad's condo and told him I had this audition. And it was for this Spielberg show. And so we 
worked on it together. Mm. We worked on the audition and the audition scene was this scene where it was in, in the movie. He tells a story about his dad bringing the whole family to Hollywood to be on the Price is Right or one of those shows. Uh -huh. And they and uh, every, everybody was dressed up and they were so excited. My dad got picked and he had to choose. Uh, he had to choose between door number one, door number two and door number three. And if he picked the right one, he'd get an all expense vacation, a million dollars, whatever. And he opened he picked the door that opened up and it was a thousand toothpicks in a jar. So he, he so the shame, the embarrassment of his father's oh, dreams and his him being uh embarrassed in front of his family and this whole thing. So that was, that was the, that was the scene and we worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And then he drove me over to Amblin on the universal lot. And, uh, we went there to Spielberg's office and it was late. It was like five. It was like, it was like at the end of the day. And I remember my dad, my dad didn't pull into the, like, he kind of stopped in the universal back lot part and i had to like walk into the compound because he didn't know where to park so oh, i go into yeah. the compound and it is horribly intimidating and i walk in beautiful terracotta tiles and i'm standing there and there's a picture of there's a poster of i think et or like r2d2 putting a crown on et's head because oh. it took over the biggest budget thing ever in history yeah. or whatever and Mark Marshall, this guy who is Steven Spielberg's assistant, walks in and he said, Sean. And I said, yeah, he said, follow me. There was no one there. It was like some sort of a like a like a Medellin drug compound or something. You were like, what the hell is this? <laughs> so we're walking down this long, you know, thing. And, and it's it's like a march to death. And and I and Mark is looking at me. And he says, uh, you nervous? And I said, yeah, I'm a little nervous. He goes, why? You're just about to meet the most powerful man in Hollywood. And he opens the door. Oh, what a setup. Well, he, he setup. boned me. I should be mad at him. So oh, I was man. like, the blood drained from my face. And I walk in and Richard Donner was there who directed. And and uh, Steven Spielberg was there. And you can look at it. You can download it. It's oh, the most gosh. appalling display of, like, kid energy. And <laughs> I, go, I get back and, and I messed it up. And I used a curse word. You did? And, yeah, that's said, funny. Shit. Said, oh, shit. <laughs> You're, and but, then I looked up like, oh no! And well, Spielberg, think about how bad everyone else must have been. If yeah, you think you they must have been horrible. They were they were at the bottom or, of the barrel, or but they had already decided on you. He left the room. Spielberg, I I, cur I cursed and he got up and walked out of the room. And he probably Richard loved it. He said later he was he didn't want to make me nervous. He could tell, you know, he um, so but that's not what I thought. I thought, well, yeah, I'm never gonna work in Hollywood again. So Dick Donner, uh -huh. the director, comes around and he kneels down next to me and he just tells me, and he this would happen a couple times during the movie where my normal he let all the hyper kids be hyper. That's mm. what Goonies is. It's just mm -hmm. like it, it was like a documentary. I mean, we we're all talking at the same time. It's horrible. <laughs> And uh, but he gets down and he looks me in the eye on his knee and he he tells me what he wants. And and you could just feel like the tractor beam on my hyperactivity got turned down. And uh, he walked back and he sat around this table again. And I did it again. And I messed up at the end. And I and I and I pulled out a chair and I sat down. You can see this on the video. And by the time I'm finished with it. This this is what got me. The, I think this is what got me the job. The time I'm finished with it, I get I, I get through it, and I pause, and he goes, "What do you think?" And I go, "That's all right." And I was like, I was tired. I like wasn't in the room with these people anymore. Yeah. I was just like in my own world. You know, though, and, you probably uh, like your nerves might have made you more natural, maybe. But also, it sounds like, I mean, the character was a little high strung, right? Wasn't the character like supposed to be like the one that's kind of like leading the chart, like Trump, but like also like. It was Stumbling just me. around a bit, like it was just me. It's you, and you were you. And they it's said exactly I had the part the second I walked in the room, and the only reason they dragged it out was just to see like what how he would do with, you know, repetition and like test his, you know, because kids working, you don't know if a kid's got the yeah. energy to like at yeah. the end of the day if they're tired and you're doing a thing. So I well, walk out to my dad, and he goes, "How'd it go?" I said, "Didn't get it." He's like, "What do you mean?" I said, "I was terrible. I couldn't get through it." He said, that's impossible. He goes, you 
were so prepared. There's no way that they, and we had this other audition for another movie, the explorers that was, that we were working on. By the time I got home, the agent called and he's like, I don't know what you did in there, but you got the offer. Wow. I, was like, I didn't believe it. So it's always, so I always point. found that it's always the one, especially when I was younger, it'll always be the ones. We just talked about this recently with Soleil Moonfry because I auditioned for Punky Brewster with her. And I'd always say, I got it or I didn't get it, right? You walk outside and my mom's like, so? And I'd be like, I got it or I didn't get it. And Soleil heard a little girl say, I got it. So she thought she didn't have the part. So she went in and like was not nervous because she thought that it wasn't even her part. And I think that that might be why, you know, she was relaxed and, and got the part. But I think it might have been me that was like, I got it, mom. Like, I would never I don't think I would have said that around someone else. But like there is that that childhood actor thing of like, I got it. I didn't get it. Like you get that feeling. But when you think you didn't I think get every it. Every actor's like that. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. But you like walk out of an audition. I've oh, said to so many. You're there's so many times I've said, if I don't get an I will be shocked if I don't get an offer on that based on not just how I felt about it, but like seeing them. Yeah. On yeah. on Turtles. So I was, I walked out of, um, Oso and the agent called and said, you know, they're, they're starting shooting, recording Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, on like Monday and they don't have their Raphael and they want to know if you'll, you know, audition. And I'm oh, like, wow. well, I audition. I'm like, yeah, of course I'll audition. So I drove over there and I walk in and there's like 500 people in the booth. There were like so many people. All the the casting and their people, the executives and their people, the creatives and their people. And it was like packed, standing room only. And I started doing it. And the, it was this overwhelming feeling of relief that they had with just like the first tone in my voice. That all it was a great, it was the most fun audition I ever had because it was like they were putty. They were putty in they my head. Their, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I can imagine doing the exact same thing. For the engineer and the and the you know the creative person with not all those people in there, not having any reaction and sucking. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. Wait. So you so on Goonies you worked with uh, how do you say his name? Kihu. Kihui Kwan. Kihui. Kihui. Yeah. So, Academy and, Award winning actor. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. How did you feel about that last year? How did I feel? I was like sobbing with the rest of the world. So I mean, it's just. Every once in a while, there's justice in the world. And I don't know how things work, but mm. he was so good in that movie. So good. He was he so good. stunts, right? Well, he, he he was during time that he wasn't acting and he always had a, a dignity about himself when he would talk about it. He would never say like, you know, the industry doesn't want me anymore. He would mm. never kind of you know, wallow in that concept. He'd just be like, well, I'm not acting right now. So I'm chore I'm choreographing Kung Fu for like, I don't know if it was John Woo, but it was like some serious Kung Fu movies down right. in, in, uh, in Asia and Hong Kong, I think. And, um, and then we would go on these, we would go on uh, conventions together and, you know, the convention audiences are amazing. The people who come they're they're that they, I don't want to say they're fickle, but like it takes them a minute to hone in. I remember I would, um, you know, with the finances with these things as a paid personal appearance, right? Yeah. They would set a bar like, okay, this is what your paid personal appearance is. And then like the amount of people that came wouldn't reach that amount. And so mm -hmm. they were like out of pocket and mm -hmm. you're like, Oh God, I suck. And so there were now there's so many more people. The money is so much, the appearance fee is so much higher. But in that, in, in a certain period of time, 2008, 10, 12, something in there, maybe it's because of the economy, I don't know. But, but, um, so key was like that. The audience, like, didn't get it. Yeah. The crowd didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's like, this is short round. This is data. <laughs> and when people would kind of like, you'd see the, they'd start to understand who was there, they would get, excited or whatever well i just went i think a few weeks ago to uh, springfield missouri to a convention and a whole lot of people came up to me to see if i would sign their item and it had key's signature on it and oh. i was like when did you get this and they're like we got it a month ago and i asked how much they paid for it yeah yeah, he's getting. Yeah, well, I mean, I, you're just like, 
it's I mean, just... he's also got a huge, I mean, yeah, Everything Everywhere All at Once is a huge recent hit, but like, he was also in Indiana Jones, so it's like yeah. an X-Men, right? Like, he would yeah, be which a- are, which are, um, which are con, con you know, yeah, uh, Comic-Con, con sci-fi, like, they're big yeah. ones, but, but the audience needs to, like, it just takes a little bit of time for mm-hmm. it to, you know, like, because right. he's an adult. Yeah. You know, short round was a little kid and here comes an right. adult. I'm always shocked when people recognize me. They're like, oh, you're in Goonies. I'm like, I'm a 50 year old man with a white beard. How can you, I was 12. <laughs> you know? uh, so anyhow, Key is now carrying studio pictures. Yeah. He is, um, he, he's just, so talented. you've never met a more decent, kind hearted, loyal like just good man. He's just a good man. You watch this happen to somebody and you go, wow, thank God there is justice in this world sometimes. That's awesome. you know? Well, and I remember when we were on uh no good Nick, we would sign autographs for the audience once in a while, but almost every show night. But um, I remember being like people, I just thought I just got such a kick out of like walking around the set and asking people, what's your favorite Sean Astin project? Like you, there's just so much. <laughs> It's like okay, so once upon a time, I was asked at a at a, a Caddyshack golf tournament with Bill Murray. They were like, the the auction item was pick three of Bill's movies. We will put the movie um, DVD covers in the frame, and he will sign them. So pick your three favorite Bill Murray. You can't pick just three. Awesome. You really can't because like, do you pick Lost in Translation, which is his Oscar, or do you pick Caddyshack? But are you also a Fletch? Oh, now Fletch. Um, are you also like, is it is it like? Or is it Groundhog Day? Or is it something like Scrooge, which is not like, and you're the same way, Sean. It's like, oh, you can't just pick Scrooge. We have to talk about Scrooge. Scrooge. Uh, Right. Scrooge this year. I did do Scrooge. Uh, That is very, it's an amazing thing. Um, There's a few compliments that you get in your life that are like really memorable. And two of the most memorable, one is from my mom when she said, she's kind of like, thinking about Lord of the Rings when it came out. And she's like, you've worked so hard for this. And she, from her, she was a workhorse. Mm. My mom was a, you know, a, a serious professional. Yeah. 50 years of hard grinding work, you know, and, and, mm. uh, and, and the hours and the number of shows. And so from her, I was just like it. And she wasn't even like sort of saying it as a compliment. She was just like thinking it out loud. And then another one is where people will come up and they'll say like, Oh, your body of work. And you think of like, Oh, I guess that's, I guess there's like a body of work. I guess that's right. <laughs> I yeah. guess you, how old are you when you get a body of work? Is that like, are you, is there oh, a, you work I mean, you were 23. Yeah, I mean, let's see. So you did Goonies. You did, I mean, and I'm not even going in order, but like between Goonies and then um, and then doing Rudy when you're really young and then the Lord of the Rings trilogies, Hobbit, like, and, and my, well, my, my favorite. kids need to hear this. Guys. <laughs> I know, right? No kidding. I feel the same way about my kids. They don't know anything. My favorite though is 50. I mean, we have to talk about Lord of the Rings real quickly. But like, I want to talk about 50 First Dates because that's my favorite. You wear that freaking mesh shirt. You're that's all jacked. So good. <laughs> You give yourself a lisp and you talk about like your, you know, (laughs) nocturnal emissions. It's hilarious. It's a, it's a deceptively heartwarming movie about making your, you know, love fall in love with you every day, like doing something to make, but it's also walrus sperm jokes. (laughs) 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 You know, um, that one, I remember I was, I was, it was after Lord of the Lord of the Rings was like doing great. And I was up in Vancouver acting and directing a show. And, uh, and I had to, we had to come down to Elijah and I were giving Peter Jackson, uh, we're presenting the DGA award to Peter Jackson. And it was like, what an honor to be able to be in front of that room and, Mm. uh, you know, invite this person, you know, out, whatever. So, uh, but there was this movie, this, and and they're like the agents were so fired up about it, and I read it, and I'm like, well, it's good. I was like, there's no part for me in it. I mean, it's a great Adam Sandler vehicle. They're like, no, 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 Doug, the brother. And I'm like, <laughs> I read it, and it didn't read like anything. So I go really in. Flat? You had to like color it all. I, I just, well, I mean. Looking back on it, okay, so I go in to meet the director and the producer on the Sony lot. 
and they were doing the music uh, next door. They had a whole orchestra set up. They were scoring uh, anger management. Oh. <laughs> and if you've ever been on a scoring stage, you've got, you know, like the – LA Philharmonic or the London Philharmonic yeah. and there's a screen set up and it's you're like in a movie theater basically I mean or you are yeah but in uh, a sound stage it's like a combo it's a twofer and and the it's technical from the recording side of things so you've picture like you know the Beatles recording in a little booth now add 96 other people right. and every time somebody messes up and you got to start it's a federal case and it's incredible <laughs> it's maybe the best part of the whole thing and they were like talking to me and I'm like, they must really want me in this movie because like, I don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking them interesting or uh, interested questions about the thing. And they're just so passionate about me and this character. And, and, and I'm thinking, well, I, this is one of those, I know I got it. I don't know why, you know, I know I got it because they would never take, 40 minutes away from their scoring session. I was feeling guilty for the musicians. And uh, I mean, they kept doing what they were doing, but that's was my, in my mind. But um, I get home and they said, you have to, they said, you have to audition. You have to put yourself on tape. This was in 2003 or four. Put yeah, yourself we, on tape was a new thing. No. Yeah. That must be like a real camera. And then you had to like somehow hand deliver the, I, it was brand. I'm always way ahead of the curve on these things. Let me tell you. You are. Uh, so, but my, I said, I'm not going to audition for this part. There's nothing there. And we were living in this, you know, people are always amazed when I say this, but we did, I didn't get paid well on Lord of the Rings. You I told me about that yeah. story. It's actually kind of shocking. Yes. Yeah, horrifying. Horrifying. Like, but it's, yeah. I mean, look at Scotty Pippen. Yeah. yeah. You know, you know the Bulls? Have you seen yep. the Bulls documentary? Yep. Uh if the you one know, if you don't want to kill somebody, you know, in the universe for not paying Scotty Pippen appropriately for being like the greatest number two and so but uh but anyhow, a lot that was true for a lot of us. But um and yet we'd do it again because it was the greatest thing we ever did. So um besides no good neck, you mean, right? Like up until then, no good neck second. Yeah. It. I just want to make sure. Sure, for sure. For okay. sure. <laughs> so Christine says my wife of now 33 years, uh, you have to, you have to do it. And I said, I, I really, I'm too tired. I'm like directing this thing. I got to get be in, we're in Calabasas. I got to be in Vancouver at like seven in the morning in the editing suite. And in order to be an 11 on the set acting in this episode, I'm like, I'm too tired. And she gave me one of those spousal looks where she goes, do it. And I was like, oh, shit. All right. So I did it. And it was. But you got to go to Hawaii for like a month. Or yeah. More. A little more. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Barrymore and Ackroyd. I mean. Did like, you take her with you Blake. is the question. She said you of had to course, do it. Of course. That was always the rule. Until the kids got old enough to tell me they didn't want to go. They got to go wherever I went. Um, that was yeah. the only. That was my only stipulation. They, I mean, they I pay you pay you very little uh, to be in the trilogy, but as long as my wife and kid are there, then I'm creating. And you did those in New, You did Lord of the Rings in New Zealand, right? Yeah. yeah. So you've Any been place in an island or a volcano. I'm happy. Were you? But were you that one, so? I did the audition, and I kind of went all out on it. Yeah. Well, when did you yeah. decide to do the lisp? I just want to know how you decided. To well, do they it. said they said we'll, we'll try one with a lisp, and I was like, I was offended. I mean, I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't offended. I, w I was like, yeah. it just seems like a crutch. It seems okay. like a gimmick. Yeah. yeah. And so I did the audition. Uh, my buddy came over and filmed it. And it was in the front of this little house we were in. I mean, it was like, and I did a bunch of goofy shit too. But he, I said, well, let me do one with this lisp. And I did it. And it was like, there it is. There's no <laughs> other way to do it. <laughs> Watch yourself, pal. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And the mesh, you were like a neon Protein mesh. Fake, yeah. People yeah. now are wearing that. It's become a thing. It's really fun. Yeah. You go, oh, I no. Can... My kids wore it to like coming home, the coho, which is like the winter formal. Like they have to wear neon and white. And I'm pretty sure a few of them wore those mesh. One of my friends wants me to like wear something like that to a girl's trip to the beach. I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> 47, not going to I go to Sony. I go to the wardrobe fitting. 
And so now, and I'm like, all right, here we go. Wardrobe fitting. I walk in and it's one of these fittings where I'm sure like Greta Garbo or, you know, <laughs> any of those grand lady, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, like in like Patty Duke or <laughs> I was thinking of gone with the wind. I was thinking of, you know, oh, yeah. it, 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 there's a huge round stage with mirrors everywhere and benches mm -hmm. and chairs and like a cappuccino oh, yeah. maker. And, you know, it's like, Holy cow. You know, usually you walk into a closet and the person's like, try that on. So I walk in, all of the hanging racks are empty. There's nothing anywhere except on the middle of the floor is the bumblebee stretch pants shorts and the mesh shirt. That's it. I walked in and I was like, okay, I get what we're doing. Here. Oh, <laughs> the costume for the entire movie. I was like, and I just looked at the costumer and I was like, okay. That's hilarious. Now I, now I understand we're at 11. I'm we're, so we're jealous. Starting. Like, I want to do a role, a character that's that out of control. Like, I mean, I guess the only thing I ever did was a movie called Can't Hardly Wait, and I got to play yearbook girl. And I was on, like, a pink tight dress, and I had these crazy pigtails. And I chased everyone in the movie with my yearbook and said, can you sign my yearbook? Will you sign my yearbook? You got to sign my yearbook. And I, like, annoyed people. But that was, yeah, the, like, priceless didn't memories. Wait, didn't we wear... I was frozen in time, people! Didn't we wear something in... Uh goofy outfits and oh we did no a good 90s Nick. theme episode of no good nick we did um yeah like i want like overalls or something backwards or like funny pattern shirts and well, i thought it was like a boy band something i can't remember but um but, well here's the thing isn't it true that you watch certain actors and they just like go for it and yeah. you're like i i don't know the only reason i did that is because the wardrobe person put that on me <laughs> Well, it's it's one of the great things of my life yeah, that yeah. I've ever done. People tell me about it all the time. I would never have had the, well, I might've had the creativity, but I don't think I would have had, maybe, I don't know. It was, you're so grateful when you, um, I'm so grateful when I get into situations where basically I'm like a meat puppet. And oh, just, like, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I said, Sean calls us meat puppets. I'm like, always like Sean says meat. I use that term all the time now, meat puppet, but like, it's true. Like, <laughs> You know, I think it's not a compliment, but the, yeah, uh, no, my, I know it's not, I know it's I not, know. It's so it true. was my nickname on one movie I did when I was a kid. I did uh, toy soldiers and, oh, and, yeah. uh, Dan Petrie jr. The brilliant called me meat puppet all the time. Well, like, it's it. like, you know, you have the words written for you. The director's kind of telling you what to do. This one's telling you what to wear. This is what the set looks. This is what your bedroom looks like. So not having a lot of creative control can be really, but like, it also feeds into who the character becomes. Right. So like in that case, someone asked you to do the lisp, you did it. It worked. You were able to like, I don't know if I can manipulate a lisp enough to make it consistent for a character. But then like, if someone puts you in that costume, like you kind of become that in a way, right? Like you put, yes. you put in the set and put it on like, and suddenly you're like, what? yeah. Cause like auditions are really hard because you're like in a blank space with like a guy playing a girl or like, you're supposed to be romantically involved with this older middle-aged woman who, you know, like, and you're like, yeah. wait, what? Like, so like going, going back to the celebrity versus, uh, kind of work a day voice actor. Uh-huh. The thing about the the everyday voice actors is they're incredible. They're incredible. You'll say, hmm, can you do a little this? Can you do a little 1920s? Hmm, can you do a rapid patter that? Can you do can you do a falsetto? Can you do a South African accent? And they're just like, yeah, or or what do you have in there that you could do? And they're like, hmm, what about this? What about yeah. that? So I was doing one show where I came in and the director said, why don't you do this with like the like a Daffy Duck sound? <laughs> now, some people can do Daffy Duck great. I can't do Daffy Duck great. People shouldn't, yeah. But, but I, so I was like, I don't know if I can do that. She's like, you can do it, you can do it, just do it. And I was like, oh my God. So I started doing it and she's like, yeah, it's great, just do that. And I'm like, it's amazing what you're capable of that you don't know you're capable of until somebody... Mm -hmm pushes you pushes you and or i don't know if that was like unwatchable because i can't remember ever seeing or hearing that it came out anywhere but but that <laughs> sensation inside of like i was compelled to do something that i really didn't think i could do and then i kind of like found a way to make it work so i don't know yeah. I, i'm sure there are some part of the kaleidoscope of what everything we just said you'll find listen get to do your 
goofballishness. I, you know, I, I like to play into it. I've got, I mean, I've got, I, that, that's the thing too. Someone's got to give you a safe space to be able to do it, right? Like the director or the writers or the producers have to give you like a safe space to be able to experiment and have fun with it. And the time, I feel like everything's done so cheap these days and so fast that nothing is done where you can take the time to experiment like that. So I bet amazing. the secret for you would be makeup. Like if you had on like Cruella mm -hmm. DeVille makeup or well, something. Sabrina that was all different, weird, strange character. The most fun I had, because Sabrina, I didn't really identify with the character. She was sort of a wallflower who didn't want too much attention and was always causing trouble that she had to get out of. And I, I like to be a little bit more like, I don't know, loud and goofy. Mm -hmm. But like the times I got to play, in every episode I got to play something else. I got to play Cinderella. I got to play Cyrano. I got to play something else, and that's when I had fun. Was like I'm a pencil today, or I'm a snowman, or you know, well, I'm gonna it, with, one in the volcano. Or with Fifty First Dates, I was like a minor character. Yeah, yeah. So you actually have the freedom to like do something outrageous because they just won't use it if it doesn't work yeah, As yeah, yeah. Opposed to if you're that's anchoring true. a show but it was so you... sweet too the way you're protective over her you big brother like it's so cute <laughs> wait so tell us okay well i want to ask you one question if you're not comfortable answering this we'll delete it but um lord of the rings you said there was a scene there's a scene where you get and i still have not seen it sean i am like the worst friend ever terrible You've not seen lord of the rings i have not shocking I know I have not I'm like the worst friend. I've been saying for years, like the whole time we were doing no good. Nick, not I was only are you not a good friend, friend, but you're, you're well, you know, there's different <laughs> their friendship is like, let me drive you to the doctor or like, let me help you move your couch. But if you're like, can you help me move my entire three bedroom? You know what I mean? Like there's, it's too much. <laughs> Lord of the Rings may be a bridge too far to ask a friend purely on the basis of friendship to have to sit through. It's like 12 hours. No, but I was doing, I was binging Game of Thrones while we're doing No Good Nick. And the whole time, I'm like, I got to binge Lord of the Rings. But, you know, there's something about like episodes of shows it, versus a no movie, way, long movie. I know. No I probably, brain. You and, like, love it. And I had a big crush on Elijah. What, like, it's like a whole thing. <laughs> well, the thing is, it, it's all about, I remember talking, um, we got to go on a super yacht like a $150 million yacht, Ooh. you know, <laughs> Hobbit perks. <laughs> Hobbit per well, there was an elf with us. Orlando Bloom was there too. And uh, I mean, this play, it was just stupid. It was during the America's cup uh, regatta. Oh. And so we were actually, we took this thing uh, in the water, in the ocean, they set these buoys up like, I don't know, miles apart. And the, and the, the sailboats have to do a thing. But if you look at it, like on a map, it's almost like a racetrack um, and there's a, a space kind of down the middle and the media boat can go there. And this big super yacht, we got to go on the super yacht yeah. and, uh, and watch America's cup from this super yacht. It was incredible. But I remember talking to, I don't know if it was the captain or one of the, one of the like first mates or something. And he said, Oh, you know, and this is while we were filming. So nobody had seen anything. You say Lord of the Rings in America back then, people were like, what? Um, Hobbit, maybe. maybe but the book. Yeah. Yeah. I knew the Hobbit from being younger. Was there, there was a, was there a Hobbit movie or just the book previous? There was. Oh, like there was, uh, you mean before they did the three Hobbits? So they did yeah. Lord of the Rings and they did three Hobbits. And then uh, there was, there must have been. I know they did yeah, the. I uh, it whether I read the book or something, but. Ralph Bakshi did a cartoon animated version of Lord of the Rings in the 60s or 70s. It was really okay. kind of, it, it's really interesting. But, but anyway, he said, you know, there was a time that we were, I was on a yacht or whatever they call it, ship, vessel, whatever. Uh, and we were kind of like stuck in Anchorage, Alaska. He said we were waiting for some part for an engine or some part for something, an anchor or something like that. So we were there for like two weeks. He said, and in the little cubby hole, there was a copy of Lord of the Rings. Uh. He said, so I sat down. He said, you know, at night you can walk out and you just see all the stars. There was nothing. This is way before Internet. You know, but there, it was it was the the context mm. of his experience of the books that made it so important for him. People I know people in military, lots and lots of people in military settings who look at the Lord of the Rings books as these kind of like 
touchstones that get them through their military deployments. Oh, yeah. And like, I know sailors who uh, read the book once a year as a, as a, as a, I don't know, as a ritual almost, almost or as, a, yeah. Yeah, as, as a tradition. And uh, the movies have kind of become that for some people. We, we binge them every Christmas time when my family comes home. So you lead a life, Melissa, that is like 50 people's lives all in one. I think if you were to find a context that was like where nothing was going on and you could just like watch them, yeah, yeah, they, they hold up. If all three of my boys to sit down at the same time, we'd watch it. Have <laughs> they sure. watched it? No, I well, no, they haven't actually. It's one of the few that like we have not done yet, and we just have no, to do just it. Start the first one. We and do I Sunday night movie nights now, and if I can get all of them together this Sunday, we will be watching it. But we told you a story once, and again, if you don't want to. Lord of the Rings? Yeah. You told Lord me of the Rings. Story. Yeah. Very basically, evil. the idea is that. No, no, no. Evil. I don't, no, I don't, don't. No. You don't have to tell me the story of the Lord of the Rings. I want you to tell me a story from the set where you had to cry for like 37 takes or something like that. Did you tell me? Oh, my gosh. We cried through that whole series. It was a <laughs> lot of crying. It was a lot of crying. <laughs> I remember. I mean, Dem there, are different, there are different stories. One story was it was the fair. Um, we're farewelling. Well, I'll try not to, well, spoiler alert. 30 okay, years go for it. it. I'll forget. Well, we're saying goodbye to one of the main characters who's going across the sea. And uh, we're all, it's a very sad parting. And so we're all crying. And it was like really special. It was really amazing um, connection that we all had with each other. And we just kind of like achieved what you'd want to achieve. And then we're going to come back after lunch and keep doing the work or whatever. And it was discovered that I had, not put on the right vest. Oh, so we had to no. redo all of the, the. I must be beloved by my fellow actors because otherwise they would have freaking killed me. They like do his part and then CGI him in there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh that was gosh. one. No, but you know some of them. Some of the, the, there's some really powerful kind of like, depending on what's of interest to you from an acting perspective, I can remember doing scenes where you were like, Lord, Lord of the Rings didn't have any financial constraints mm -hmm. relative to the performances. Maybe if they wanted to do another cave troll sequence or build another incredible battle set somewhere, they would have to have budget conversations, but we filmed the only limitation was light, you know, yeah. or until people just, we, we would film endlessly. And the director was, you know, Peter Jack was very, there used to be this thing of like, oh, you got it in one take. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> then there used to be this thing about like, oh, um, uh, what's his name on a uh, clockwork orange or whatever, uh, 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 Stanley Kubrick, like he would shoot a million takes or on, um, heaven's gate or whatever, like, you know, uh, Michael Cimino shot a million tapes and there. And somehow it was like, you're either like this total pro that you never have to do it again, or you're this ridiculous person wasting studio resources yeah. and it's going to create a flop. Yeah. That was all like <laughs> gone. And now we were just in a scenario where, the director could afford to just keep doing it. And sometimes you do it and then you do it again and then you do it again and be like, you know what, let's try it with a crane. And they do a crane and they set up the crane and you do it again. And they'd be like, no, you know what, let's do it with a this and let's do it. Let's try it where you come in the other way. And so he would literally like a pottery wheel be just kind of like, shaping and shaping oh, and shaping crazy though. I couldn't work oh. like that. Like I'd be like, did you get it yet? Come on. Well, here's the thing. Every single person on Lord of the Rings was doing the best work we'd ever do in our whole life. Mm. There was no question about it. The Except for no good Nick. Hold on. You keep forgetting that. Like I mean with 21st century good. 20, okay. Okay. I just 20th make... century good. Um, the set design. The costumes, yeah. the every single thing you saw, touched, worked with was the best. Yeah. It doesn't get better. You get you chain have the You just didn't have the salary. <laughs> right. Didn't, yeah. Well, they saved the money on us and put it on the. No, but I mean, like the way they would make the chain mail, you know, mm. and then you'd have the New Zealand Army come and you have 800 people wearing orc chain mail. So mm. you, it would be. 
ungrateful to all of the other people mm-hmm. who worked at the be- at their you know beyond their energy capacity beyond their financial resources like beyond if you didn't if you didn't get it right and but what was interesting was because you and I come from a world where you know you got to shoot between the, the the tree guy, the guys trimming the tree thing. You know, like, uh, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. you're losing the light. There was no losing the light with Lord of the Rings. We come back yeah. the next day. Yeah. You know, and, the, and but they, all of us, every now and then, you'd like something would happen, and this happened with crying a lot. You'd be crying and crying and crying. You'd go through kind of a fake crying, trying to because there it's not there, and then you you discover something, and now you'd really be sobbing, and then it kind of you know we would do. T- 20, 30, 40 takes. And, and at certain points you'd abandon the heat, abandon it. Cause you go like, you know what? 24 ago, it was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. 20 yeah. ago was great. And we didn't improve on great. So let's let it go. And whenever he did that, I'd be like, do one more. Oh, you know, and he, he you let go. you, anybody could ask for another one. Yeah. And um, yeah. So there, there That's was funny. something about that thing that I was saying before about the, the voiceover thing where you do something you're not capable of, where you don't know what's inside you yeah, until it's, until it's challenged. Well, and Sean, you were also just so much more patient and um, grateful than like 92% of the world and myself included. Anybody on that show was, everybody on that show was like that. You, that's awesome. you showed that's up, you, like you get to be around wonderful people like that. No, but you, you, um, now I don't know what it's like to work on the Marvel universe. Like, mm. I've never done any of those shows. Um, something tells me that we established kind of a template and that template has grown through the Harry Potter series. And I think through all those oh, other yeah. things, I, I think, I think those folks would maybe not on the one-off movies, maybe not on Iron Man, but like on the mo- movies where you could tell they're doing a bunch of them. I think yeah. they would give some, uh, acknowledgement that Lord of the Rings because like we wore hobbit feet and the hobbit feet were made of this rubber and they would glue us into them and they had to use hair and the hair was from real Russian women that would be imported and you had to do it on an industrial scale day after week after month after year and there's like there had to be that was part of it it was the industrialization of the creativity was part of it too but you You just, there were moments where I just thought I was like, wasn't going to be able to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Like I just it don't does, think I can. It was exhausting. Yeah. It was exhausting. But, but, rewarding. The, but rewarding. the director set the tone. Yeah. And when you, and not just the director, but like he was also, he was the, the, he was the Uber dude. And when you showed up, like we got off the plane, we went straight to wardrobe. Mm. You're like, I just flew 16 hours like give me, i want to go shower no nope, we're gonna go right there and oh. they just there was gonna be no slack in their nothing was precious yeah none of the stars who came in were like more important than everybody else we all went into this thing that was like okay it's not it's really not about money it's gonna be about yeah. money eventually but right yeah. now this is not about money yeah, penalties it's, won't bother you yeah <laughs> like Oh, wait. So Sean, so, oh my gosh, we've like overextended our welcome here with you. And I could, you know, we, you and I used to have very long lunches for 20 weeks straight that would never end. And we'd be in the parking lot for hours, but we have a few questions we have to ask you and we want to know about all the things you binge. So, well, first of all, is there anything you're really into right now? Any binge shows, books, movies? A uh, bunch. So just, just finished Game of Thrones again. You USA. did? Yeah. I think this it's the third time me. I've gone all the way through. It's just... It's just incredible. Um, we um, we just finished Blacklist. We okay. watched every episode of Blacklist, all like eighteen seasons or t- ten seasons. Um, um, that's a big. So, one. what are we watching? We have a list. Troy is on the list. I was just instructed about how I'm not watching romantic comedies properly. Oh um, no! Well, yeah. how does any- one watch a romantic comedy? Well, wrong? apparently, you don't go. This is stupid. Apparently that's not the right way to do it. Oh, Sean. <laughs> My wife is like, Sean, you know, when I watch these movies, I'm thinking about us. And when oh. you come in and crap on it, I'm like, oh, that's my guy who doesn't care. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> what else? I have to say, um, she's right. Yeah. You're watching them wrong. 
<laughs> well, I've just had to watch so many is the problem. Yeah, he's, you're um, surrounded by women. Like the way I have only like pirates and vampires around me. I'm like, all right, enough. There's no battle. Uh, apparently, we're going to be doing uh, – so Bella, the youngest one's uh, boyfriend, has her – thinking a lot about Star Wars. I kind of turned her on to Star Wars a little bit, but we've been discussing binging all of it, including yeah, yeah, all of it. the animateds, including all of the prequels. TV shows. Everything, That's yeah. So much. It will change her life. It will. It's so much. Um, all right, so we have a lot of questions. We, we ask everybody these questions, but I want to get your take on them. And I mean, just like, you know, feel free to give like, Simple answers if you want. Um, is there a movie that you feel like you should have watched but you haven't yet? Uh, yeah, um, like it could be a classic or maybe one of these last Oscar movies. No, no, it's a good one, it's a good one. You'll like this, and I'll be horrified to say this. Actually, he knows Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Oh, uh, that's uh right. Elijah's in it. Oh, that's right, Elijah stars in it, and he apparently, I've talked to many many people whose opinion i love and trust and and they're like this is the greatest movie you have got to watch this movie you will love it yeah you that would. one also like um i don't know anything about it but i i what's the one um sophie's choice oh i won't oh. Watch. i'm scared of that one yeah yeah same yeah. yeah but we should watch it it's a i have a question. sophie's choice i've what never seen it, it. Mm -mm. i'm afraid I of can't it. handle it no i'm I afraid can't. of it guys Here's a question though, Sean. Chosen. I haven't watched Chosen. I should watch Chosen. As of no, as of 2019. Oh yeah, because you were in Woodlawn too. Anyway, we didn't even get into that. But oh, 2019, as of 2019, you had never seen Valley of the Dolls. Have you watched it? I've seen well, sequences. <laughs> uh, his mom's his mom's the star. And I know, but I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's no, that it's, no, and the re there's I kind of have Maybe a good you reason. You would love it, but he I get why he doesn't want to watch it. Like he doesn't watch his mom I, in that situation. But the sex thing is bad enough. It. I remember coming into the house at one point and the, her boob was out in a movie, and I'm like, I can't watch this. But <laughs> I think that was preparing me for daughters. Like stuff comes at you with daughters, and you're like, I don't want to know. Well, her, um, she has this one singing <laughs> performance where she has this double pearl necklace on. It goes down, and the way she's dancing, the pearls go around each boob. And I always watch it as like a continuity thing, right? Like That's whether funny. the pearls but are on the boobs. So my mom was uh, had bipolar uh, mood disorder, mm -hmm. and she became a very kind of outspoken, nationally sort of recognized advocate for mental health awareness, mental health destigmatizing bipolar, mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff. So and I now go and give talks about this all over the country too from the perspective of a family member who grew mm -hmm. up with this, that movie is, and the tone she strikes in that movie that she plays Neely O'Hara, who is yes. a beloved figure in the gay community. Yes, She's a gay icon for this, for playing Neely O'Hara. Um, I'm perfectly comfortable in inter interacting with people in drag as Neely. That's fine. But <laughs> watching my mom in that distress is so oh. triggering of exactly yeah. the kind of tone of how she was when we were a kid that I like, I can't handle. I see. I, <laughs> I feel the same way about some of her talk show appearances. She was on Dick really? Cavett show and apparently told them she was going to build an ark in the desert and shit like that. Like, oh, <gasps> oh I see. I yeah. get it. I totally I get, get it. it. I had a mom who struggled with mental health as well. And it, it was, it's a ride. Some things just hit too close to home and you just don't. And it's all right. Is there anything about you, anything in your life that you don't want to interact with because it brings it up in a way that's unhealthy or not unhealthy, all the but time. just like pain? I'm trying to think if there's a specific thing that I won't. Mine is my oldest daughter. She's exactly like my mom. Not in that way, but <laughs> like, no, no, not like that. No, but I just mean she's like a little carbon copy of my, she just. Oh, yeah. She'll turn that's and look and I'll be like, oh my God, my mom is looking at me. Yeah, oh, well, my in my children, I totally see things like that. My mom was a very like outgoing, creative person, and very bubbly, and so people you loved to be around her. But then she would have these little things, and you could you could almost see some of the negative stuff coming. It was like little triggers, you know. And so sometimes I see those in my siblings or my children, and I'm like. Don't do that. Don't make that face. Don't. I just had a conversation with the Walk director. Away. I just had a conversation with the director where that moment was happening and there was a clue that 
my character was given about what was happening. Sort of the audience saw me get this clue. And so I kind of adjusted and he's like, well, you know, he's like, maybe you should stay this way. And I'm like, and like anybody you know. who's ever been in this situation knows when the storm is coming and, th and that it's, you, there's nothing you can do anyway, but like to you try and figure out on eggshells. It's a natural uh, reaction. Yeah. Oof. Oof. Um, to segue. Yeah. Um, is there a TV <laughs> villain you love to hate? <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. Negan. From what's that? what's that blacklist? He's he's from Walking Dead. Oh, oh Walking Dead. Well, I yeah. watched. So when I was doing Stranger Things, I was in Atlanta. Oh my gosh, we didn't talk about Stranger Things. See, you no, just have this body of work. We're <laughs> gonna have to do a second episode. We do a whole podcast, so, Sean. There was we. I had time off. I was I was only in certain scenes, so I'd have at the Piedmont Hotel or whatever at the something or other. Everything's Piedmont. No, everything's Peachtree. Mm -hmm. Peachtree, Peachtree Street, Peachtree Lane, Peachtree Drive, Peachtree Hotel. Anyhow, okay. Piedmont Hotel. I would, I just, I finally said to myself, I'm going to watch Walking Dead because I'd been in all these conventions and Walking Dead was like the, the, the whale of the convention. And you're like, why do people like these stupid zombies so much? So I started watching it and I fell in love with it. Absolutely uh, fell in love with it. It's not about zombies. Everyone will tell you sports movies aren't about the sport. Zombie movies aren't about the zombie sports are about the human zombie movies are about the, the families, the, the, the people who are surviving. So, and then it got to this one character, Negan. I think that's his name. Uh, and I think he comes in in season six or seven and he's sadistic. He's a sadistic torturing type. Oh. And he's got this bat with this uh, barbed wire around it. You see kids dressed up for Halloween all the time. And yes. I'm like, haha, great. So, <laughs> like a, so like, model. oh, look, I punched a six year old because he was wearing that stupid Negan. <laughs> but <laughs> but the, it, it's by the third episode. I was so turned off that I literally stopped watching and haven't watched. I only it watched the first ever. Oh, really? Yeah, mm -hmm. right, yeah it was. It was. He's great. The actor is great, but there has got to be some restraint in storytelling. And I felt like they were. It was a little lazy. It was a little okay. lazy. Like they knew they clicked into something that was emotionally connecting. And if you've got a show that's going that long and it's in a post-apocalyptic it so anytime you can come up with a relationship, a setting, a sequence, an arc, a something, you know, you can see the, you, the audience and the show is like, Oh, right. Now we're, now we're going with this thing. And they figured out how, how effective he was and like raw and emotionally upsetting. And they just like, couldn't get off it. Mm. And I'm just like, you guys, I'm not going to go there with you. There, there has to be, they don't have to, um, it doesn't have to have a redeeming, moment but they got to take their foot off your throat for a that's second that's how i felt about the game of thrones the guy who kept torturing ty ty Rose. yes he him too he was just the only I'm reason like, are they gonna kill this guy he needs some I, justice yeah. this is getting that was that if the rest of the the stories weren't so good i might have bailed yeah. out for the same reason yeah. but then it kind of came in his place in his house yes yeah right like whether what he was going to inherit and yes. who he had to impress his father and his siblings. And so you, you, but it's you know, I'll tell you like, what, I want him to get his justice, but at the same time, it's kind of brilliant that they didn't do it until it was like, just right. You know, but well, I never got to enjoy Negan's fate, which I'm sure he had because I couldn't tolerate so it. Find so that episode. I'm sure you can Google it. <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, so what's your favorite book genre? Having having said that, I'm tr I've been trying for five years to convince my daughters to watch Walking Dead with me. Oh, really? <laughs> From the beginning <laughs> up till that third. Then you'll like, just make them give it up. Episode with Negan, I was fine. All right, what a uh, book, Sagan? Book genre. Your favorite book genre? Well, I'm uh, histories and biographies. Oh, of course, of course. Do you have a go-to karaoke song? Well, apparently. I scored big at the 21st birthday of my middle child when we went in Vegas to some place that seemed like a end of the world strip club, like, <laughs> you know, horror show. It was awful. It was like, I'm like, I, this many mirrors doesn't need to happen in, in my life. I don't need this many mirrors. Um, it was like a spaceship. It was kind of, and they brought a lot of sushi. That was good. Um, apparently I was good singing. Um, the lion from Wizard of Oz. Oh, if I only had a no. Yeah, if I were <laughs> king of the forest. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I would. 
and a growl. And a growl. Yeah. <laughs> All right, is there a reboot you liked better than the original? Of course, I think I can nail any of the songs from the artists that I mentioned earlier in the episode here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to play Taylor guitar. Swift? Taylor Swift? Uh, Mean. Oh, oh, let's hear it. I don't think I can acapeachy it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can. I'd have to get my little guitar out. Is that a real word? Acapeachy? acapeachy? Is that like the acapella? No, no, no. We called it. What did we? That was coined somewhere. Which one is oh. me? <laughs> And now you're Acapella. Gonna... Some cast and I came up with Acapici. I can't remember Acapici. where. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What was, oh, is there a reboot you liked better than the original? Who? A reboot? I mean, we already talked about Adam's Family versus Wednesday, but. <laughs> right. A reboot that I like better than the original. Maybe a movie or. I think a, there's probably a lot. Hold on. Let me think about this. Okay. Um. Like Ghostbusters is out right now, but not. I would. Right? No, I don't. Oh, the new. I haven't seen the new one. No, I haven't either yet. I might like that better. It looks amazing. Dune. Huh? Dune. I haven't watched the original. Yeah. Um, but that's not a. Is it a reboot or is that a, a sequel? No, it's no, a reboot. No, it's a brand new one. I guess. Oh my gosh, you guys! I don't know. I don't know. That's right. That's that a tough like. one. What was your first uh, concert? Not. Uh, I guess the ones I didn't like better. First concert <laughs> was Michael Jackson. Uh, Victory tour. No way. We just yeah. had a row. We just talked to Christine Taylor and she said she went to the Jackson Five reunion show in like 1984. Or yeah. Well, it was 84 or five uh, when what? the Victory tour, it was Dodger Stadium. And it was because Steven Spielberg wanted Michael Jackson to do a song for the Goonies. So oh, they brought man. him to the set. He got to say action for one shot. Uh, and then he invited us to this concert and we all oh went, I remember our, we all got jackets from it and it was, of course, incredible. That's so cool. Yeah. I think that, well, was, and that cool. was your first concert. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And do you have any idea what you would want your epitaph to say? Um, Oh my gosh. <laughs> this one's what would I want my good. epitaph to say? Um, Something funny. <laughs> he gave good hugs. How about that? <laughs> well, I was just, I was trying to do a play on something about uh, he finally stopped talking. <laughs> <laughs> like, my, I think that would be the good, the, the amazing thing. Say. It could my just wife say it. Go ahead. What? Well, my wife visiting, like, you know, she would be, she would, be the first time in her life when she was around me where I wasn't talking. I wonder if it could say something like that, like, feel free to talk now or something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> Your turn to talk. Uh, I, there's a few obvious ones. I mean, um, I have a quote that I said, I think, spontaneously in a speech, and then someone, a fan, fed it back to me, Ooh. and then it kind of, like, is my thing now, and I, I put, like, I send it in bios as, like, my statement. Oh yeah. Um, people will root for anyone who shows them their heart. Yes. Yes. Nice. I love that. Oh, that's, that's a good epitaph. One. Put that that's in your great epitaph. epitaph. I love it. Except I don't. I want to be cremated as quickly as possible. You can still have a headstone somewhere, even if Do you're not cremated. put me in the ground. Right. We've I want to be part of a tree. Or a diamond. I want to be composted into a tree, but. Um, you don't uh, want to be put into like a golf ball or like a rock, like they can, like or a ring. It. They can put you in a <laughs> ring now. That's she, a ring. Ring. Oh, cool. be in a diamond. She wants to be put in a diamond. Yeah, or in yeah. a firework. Firework, yeah, yeah. Firework. Wait a minute. Outer space sold. Uh, well, I want to do the Viking thing where you send me out on a raft and all my boys line up on the beach with their fire arrows and it lands and burns me into the lake. Like that's what I want. I've always said that I wanted that, but you with the boys. Yeah, I'll would, tell you what. Girls it's are my, great actors. You've seen uh, what's the what's the Merida? What's the Merida? I'm fighting for my own hand. I got that one. There it is. <laughs> <You got laughs> no, the no. Girl. I was just thinking if my girls were in charge of lighting the air, like getting the flaming arrow there, I'd go over the thing intact. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. So wait, if you were a diamond, Sean, then whenever they get engaged or whatever, or their their children or grandchildren, whatever it is, you're there. And like. It's like, a here's my you. grandpa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I don't mind if that's part of the ashes, just as long as it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to come back as a zombie. 
Yeah, no kidding, right? Yeah, let's not do that. So wait, so um, do you have I your didn't phone near you? The... Say again. We need your phone. Is your phone near you? You just have to look up how many unread emails you have. Do you know how to do that? No, 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 no. Two. No, no. You have two? No, no. Two. <gasps> My wife has fourteen thousand. Uh, Amanda has. Dun, dun, dun. Amanda. <laughs> 40,285. Yeah. I'm at. You know what you can do? What, how many? 84. I, this is how I think. I think in email. No. I can't, if I, if there was un, that, that would be terrible. I'd be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the little red dots on anything. I'm like, I check my bank account. I check this thing. I check this just to get rid of the red dots. There's a lot of dots. Oh, I hate my red dots. They, oh, I mean, they're notifications. They're there to Have tell you, you something. watch those documentaries from tech experts, like tech bros and people who invented these things. No, uh, but my they, son does. He loves those. The one, there's some great documentaries out there. I don't know the titles of them, but I watch all of them. But the, uh, the one piece of advice that, is universal amongst them is to turn off your alerts. Oh yeah. I have well they're on here well, but yeah, I don't pay attention to them. But social dilemma <laughs> hey, yeah, that's you're really good at ignoring them. I'm not because the the social dilemma thing like how they're always trying to get your attention, right? They're trying to call you back, bring you back. Like it's an addiction thing. I turn off it? notifications for like any like social media apps or even my my text messages which I'm actually very good at checking and responding to. Um, they don't pop, like, it'll say the number, but they don't like pop up automatically. Like, I, don't yeah, I have like that one. I have to, I stay on top of my text much more. I'll check my emails a few times a day, but like I have 29 texts right now. It's making me a little like nauseous. Like I remember a line from a romantic comedy <gasps> that shows, I know how to watch a romantic comedy. It's with. Robert De Niro's in it, playing kind of a older character. It's uh, Hathaway. Oh, and, uh, yeah. I, oh, yes. Yeah, I know this one. Like an intern situation. The I intern. think it's called the intern. Yeah. No, that's no interns. No internship. I don't know. So, uh, and then her boyfriend that she kind of like avoids, and then they kind of get back together, sort of at the end. I think he's the guy who stars in um, Entourage. Oh, oh yeah, Adrian. Adrian? He was with you and and was and with me. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah, and he's a he plays a chef or something in this one. No, that's Devil Wears Prada. Oh, is it? Oh yeah. yeah. You he's know the, what's the what's the quote? Which one? The one that I'm about to say. I don't know. You tell I don't me. Know. You go the person whose call you answer. That's what does he say? That's who you're. That's who you're in love with, or that's who you're. Oh. That's who you're in a relationship with. That's, your that's, that's your yes, that's who you're in a relationship with. Yeah, yeah. she he, she ignores his calls but picks up for the boss yeah. all the time. Because Miranda is calling. I know Miranda. Yes. For the record, uh the De Niro Hathaway movie is called The Intern. Yes. It is. Also yeah. good. Yeah. Sean, thank you so much for being here. I mean, we could honestly talk all day, but you know, we want to. We want to give you time with your family and that gorgeous day in California, but Seriously, um, I'm so jealous. I mean, and you're doing so much real quick. Are, did you, did you pass your master's? Did you, are, do you, are you, I'm on my uh, penultimate class. As soon as I finish this class, I have one more and then it's done. August, I should have a diploma from you American university studying public administration, public policy. What do you want to know? I can tell you anything. I want to know if you're going to run for the union. Oh, well, I'm already an elected member of the union. You mean for president or something? President, yeah. I don't know. I, maybe for in the local. I don't know. I have to think about it. Okay, I would love know. it. I'll back you up. I'll back I you up 100%. Even you though we, we used to have these big political talks and whatnot, but we could always speak. You were always a voice of reason. You're always a warm hug. And you, I, I just adore you. And we need to just do something else together again. Sold. Maybe it's the 51st dates and I'll be in a mesh thing too. 52nd date. Oh my God. 52nd date. <laughs> that's a different movie. I think that's a different genre. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, Thank you, Sean. I love you so much. Love you guys. So nice to meet you, Sean. Women at what? Woman at binge.